talking about the SL version of this. Now we're going to build on that with the HL version. So here's the list from 7.1. It's quite a long list talking about different aspects of DNA structure, which we're building on as well from 2.6, and how it's replicated as well. So here's our RNA, our targets today. Um, I can analyze the folding and replication of DNA. I can describe the patterns in scientific data, such as in photograph 51. So a little reminder before we start is this table we looked at when we we're talking about this with topic two with the SLs is all these different scientists who contributed information that was critical to understanding what DNA is and its structure. Um, and then Watson and Crick used information to figure out the final structure and build their model. So we're looking at a few different people in this list today. Uh, we'll be looking at Hershey and Chase's experiment and looking at uh, Rosalind Franklin's Photograph 51 as well, both in detail today. So let's start first by talking about how Hershey and Chase figured it in 1952 that DNA is the transforming principle. So the transforming principle is the idea that something within cells has information that can transform them in some way. Um, so, we're going to, like everything we're doing, we're working with molecules in biology, we want, can't see them, we want to figure out what things are, we're going to find a way to label them um, at the atomic level. So in this case, they're using sulfur and phosphorus atoms, both of which are radioactively labeled, to be able to kind of trace the radioactivity and figure out which molecules are being there. Um, so you had to both understand how that worked, and then be able to figure out the structure and life cycle of viruses to help figure this out. So it's one of those things where there's so much creativity in biology, especially in the design, and trying to figure out um, how we can deduce different kinds of uh, things and how we can use t techniques in the lab to figure out, to make the invisible visible for us, basically. So a lot of the creativity and problem solving here. So what they did is they grew virus to the presence of S35. Um, we know that sulfur is present in some proteins. It's one of the amino acids that contains sulfur. Um, cysteine contains sulfur, but it's not present anywhere in DNA. And this seems because they knew that the structure of viruses was mostly just DNA and protein, where the outer shell of the virus is protein, and of course inside is the DNA. So they grew viruses, the first part here, they grew the viruses in the presence of S35. Um, so the radioactive tag would only show in protein, not in DNA. And they did the same thing with viruses in P32. Uh, so phosphorus we knew was in DNA, um, much more in DNA than in silver, and pretty much much, much more in DNA. And they're going to grow that um, as well. So we have viruses that contain radioactive material on their capsid and viruses that contain radioactive material in their DNA only. And that allows them to track the movement of the DNA in the viruses and bacteria to figure out. So at this point, we thought that DNA was true, but we weren't sure. And we were, the debate was between protein and DNA. So what they did is then they took this T2 phage virus, and they knew that that virus um, injected what was then called the transforming principle, this unknown molecule that could transform and contain information in cells, um, into the bacteria. And they took the tagged viruses, um, one with the sulfur protein and one with a, a phosphorus tagged DNA, and allowed them to then infect bacteria. So we can see here we have the one that is infecting the, the, the radioactive um, protein infects bacteria, and the radioactive DNA infects bacteria. And when this virus infects bacterium, it just injects its transforming principle into the bacterium. That's how they do that, do that. And then, giving them time to attack, they would have attacked the bacterium, injected their transforming principle inside, and then the virus falls off, and the uh, inside is the transforming principle. They then take these cells that have been attacked by the viruses with the either radioactively tagged protein or DNA, and then they are able to separate them. So they use a centrifuge, the spinning um, technique to separate things based on their density. Um, so because bacteria are bigger than viruses, the bacteria sunk to the bottom of the test tube and viruses remained above in what's called a supernatant. So we look here, the bottom part here, the pellet, is the uh, the bacterium and the liquid at top, that's the liquid with the virus inside of it. 
They found radioactivity in the pellet and not in the supernatant. What does that tell you? Pause the video, talk to your classmate, try and figure this out. So when they had the radioactive phosphorus, they found radioactivity in the pellet. When they had radioactive sulfur, they found radioactivity in the supernatant, in the liquid. So here's another diagram showing this. Take a minute, pause the video, and try to explain what's happening here. Talk to a partner. Let's do this together. Well, we could tell that the radioactivity was in the bacterium when it was in the pellet. So in this case, it actually stayed in the, in the protein, in the virus, and didn't, didn't enter the cell. In this case, it had to, to go inside the cell. We know in this case, they use radioactive phosphorus to label the DNA. So the DNA is what entered the cell and what became radioactive. And here is the radioactive was in the protein part, and that left, and that's in the supernatant. It was in the virus structure itself and not in the DNA. So this was a very brilliant experiment, um, and you need to know it. It's required by the IB, and it's one of the ones that really helps us better understand and really prove that it is, in fact, DNA that is the transforming principle. It's a thing that can transform living things. It contains that information, and that comes from DNA and not protein. This was a super important thing to realize in biology. Now, another person who could read a lot to our understanding of DNA and its structure is Rosalind Franklin. So Rosalind Franklin made a really important contribution to the understanding of this um, through her analysis of what's called X-ray crystallography. So X-ray crystallography at the time in the 1940s and 50s was a very new technique. And what you would take some sort of material you were trying to study and you would crystallize it and then pass X-rays through it. So here you can see the crystallized molecule here and passing X-rays through and they would diffract the light onto some sort of film, kind of like how x-rays work today, where you can then see the image. Um, this was a very tricky technique that took knowledge at the time, and Rosalind Franklin was the first people um, in her field to really master it. So what she did, she produced a high-quality um, x-ray image, and then interpreting it is not a simple thing, especially at that time period where we didn't have a lot of... Um, other technology to help us, and people were just relying on what they could see. Um, not a lot of people knew that were experts in this field, and Rosalind Franklin did a lot of work with this as she went to France to study this, and to come back to England to put her skills to work and to use on the question of DNA. So Franklin's findings and her hard work confirmed several key components of the structure which then Watson and Crick were able to use the kind of the missing piece of the puzzle for Watson and Crick's model and they use that to figure out the overall structure. Um, and they finalize their model based on her data. Now this gentleman here, this is Maurice Wilkins. This was her laboratory supervisor, um, kind of wasn't working with her. He's described as her partner, um, but from my reading, he mo was more of a colleague with a supervisory role, um, and he actually took her data and gave it to Watson and Crick without her consent which is very unethical and very problematic. They did not get along very well at all. They just fought a lot. And I think from what I've read, the one big problem with it was that um, he did not think she was feminine enough and wasn't doing the work a woman should do as a scientist. So Wilkins was her partner, as I just said, and he, um, her partner, her supervisor. This is their most famous photograph. This is called Photograph 51, and this is one of the X-ray crystallography images that Rosalind Franklin made of DNA, and this is the best one. This is very famous, um, and it was a huge part of how we understand DNA structure is based on this photograph. So can you interpret it? We said earlier that interpreting this kind of images is something that is a tricky skill to learn. So what can you see? When you look at it, what can you read? That's DNA. How can you tell? What information can we learn from this picture here? Pause the video and really try to figure it out for a little bit. Put those, put your brains to the test, guys. Okay, so hopefully you've had some ideas. Here are some different things we can see in this. Okay, so patterns to notice. There is the X shape. 
the X shape means that we have a helix. Okay, it's repeating over time. This is kind of looking through the top of a DNA structure. If you guys talk about DNA is having a top and looking down. Um, the distance between the lines tells you how the space between the groove. It's 34 angstroms is the distance between the parts of the groove. Um, and then the other, the gaps here are telling you the overall size as well, measurements. The fact that we have these blanks, these repeats, is caused by interference where the two strands repeat themselves. Where they're overlapping, you have kind of a blank. So that's reinforced it's a double helix. And then the length of the helix is also shown by having the thickness of the lines here. Let's go through these again so you have to take this down in better quality notes here. So the X in the, the A image here tells us it is a helix. In the B image, this tells us the smears are the regular twisting of the DNA at 34 angstrom intervals. Angstrom is a unit of distance. The patches on the top and bottom in C are the base pairs, and that shows that we have a regular repeating feature that is quite small, which turns out to be the base pairs. And the gap here in D, this shows the double helix because the two helices are interfering with each other and therefore they're not showing up clearly on the x-ray. Very tricky to interpret and understand until you learn how to do it, which is why Rosens Franklin's expertise in this technique was so important. Unfortunately, she did not win the Nobel Prize for DNA structure. That was shared by Watson and Crick and Wilkins. Um, and part of the reason, for the official reason for that is because she was a, she was dead at the time. She died from breast cancer, um, and you, they don't award the Nobel Prize posthumously. But she was also given very little credit in the in uh, Watson and Crick's famous paper. They didn't really cite her. They took her data without her consent, and. Um, I can't remember if it was Watson or Crick, but many years later in an interview, they said, that, oh, Rosie couldn't understand anyway. She wasn't, wasn't able to understand her images. We have since found her journals where she was talking about what she had found and what it meant, and that she had correctly interpreted the images, but she wasn't ready to publish yet because she wanted to be 100% sure, knowing that a woman at that time in science had to be very sure and have lots of evidence support what she found before she felt confident enough to publish. So that's the story of Rosalind Franklin. All right, key ideas. Pause the video, I'll write them down, and check if you have, check for understanding. If you have any questions, please email, ask, get clarification. Okay, let's talk about DNA structure again. So Watson and Crick, in their famous article, they suggested that the structure of DNA um, its own structure suggested its mechanism for replication. And here's that quote here, which you've seen before. Okay. Um, why is that the case? Well, the base pairing, right? The complementary base pairing suggests that this, the way to do it is to match up one strand to the next. So because we have the ratios of A and T equal ratios, C and G equal ratios, and medicines between them, such as in these hydrogen bonds, um, this is reinforced again by the idea that we have this double helix from the extra crystallography images that it's bound together the two helices are matching up with these ratios of bases. For this reason they could figure out that DNA um, had complementary base pairing that's key to DNA structure which we know is, is true um, and that it proceeds in opposite directions on each strand. That's part of how um, the, the double helix has to work. If we look at our example in this picture here we can see the 3 prime to 5 prime on this end and 3 prime to 5 prime going the opposite way here. So the two strands are um, anti-parallel. They start in obstructions but are parallel to each other. Okay. All right, so replication. So we did talk about replication already with the SLs in 2.7. We're going to now build on that for the HL specific components you need to know. So replication is said to be continuous on the leading strand and discontinuous on the lagging strand. And we already kind of talked about a tiny bit earlier. So do you know what those things are? What does that mean? Well, if it's continuous, it means it's one continuous replication it goes in one big piece. And discontinuous happens in separate little fragments that then have to be attached to make a complete copy of the DNA. So this is caused by the ability of 
DNA polymerase can only work in the 3' to 5' prime direction. This causes the difference between these two strands. How does that work? What's the connection here between DNA polymerase directionality and the strand's directionality? Well, if DNA polymerase can only go 3' prime to 5', prime, then it's going to be able to do continuification only if the DNA strand is 3' prime to 5'. Prime. Now, if we're trying to just make one copy of one strand, that would not be a problem, but we need to copy both strands. So the other strand, of course, because DNA is antiparallel, happens to be in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction, and therefore can only go little segments in the 3 to 5' prime direction. Okay? And has to be joined. These little segments or fragments are called Okazaki fragments after the scientist who discovered them. Okay, so we can see here all these separate little fragments in the discontinuous part. Okazaki fragments, you can also see them here in the photo we looked at during the last lesson. Okay, so let's talk about these steps in terms of the HL level. So I take your foldable back out again and go ahead and add information based on what you, what's on the slides that you're seeing here as further clarification. Okay, so step one, DNA helicase is going to unzip a DNA double helix and to help it do that we have topoisomerases. An example of topoisomerase is DNA gyrase and it helps unwind it easier by relieving tension in the phosphate sugar backbone. We also have our Clostridia binding proteins that help by holding the strands open, which keeps the hydrogen bonds from reforming between the bases. The next step is RNA primase. It's going to lay a few RNA bases as the primer um, between and this happens on both the leading strand and the lagging strand because DNA polymerase three needs a place to start. It can't just start on a blank. It has to have a primer to get it started. DNA polymerase three is very efficient, but it needs help to get started. Okay, um, and the notice has multiple primers on the lagging strand, but only a single primer on the on the leading strand. Okay, step three, we have DNA polymerase three is going to attach to the free floating DNA nucleotides um, using complementary base pairing and using hydrogen bonds to connect those bases A with T, C with G, and over the DNA. It's going to add in the 3' prime end of the RNA primers, going the 3' prime to 5' prime direction, which is why we need multiple primers in the, on the lagging strand. Now, on the leading strand, because this strand goes towards the replication fork in the same direction, remember the replication fork is the opening in the DNA. It's going towards it. Um, it's 3' prime to 5' prime direction. DNA polymerase 3 can just continuously add the bases, one continuous fragment. It's not needed to take multiple fragments. No Okazaki fragments here. Um, it's very smooth and a lot quicker. Unfortunately, on the lagging strand, it goes in the opposite direction away from the application fork in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. DNA polymerase can only go in pieces, and those pieces are called Okazaki fragments. Think of it as kind of fooling DNA polymerase 3, so we can only fool it for a short period of time, and then it has to start again. Step four, DNA polymerase 1 is going to come along and removes all the RNA primers and replaces them with DNA bases. Now remind yourself and remind me what is the difference between a RNA primer and a DNA base? So RNA and DNA, one the important thing is the sugar is different. So we have a ribo sugar, hence the name ribonucleic acid um, in the RNA, and we have a deoxyribo sugar in the DNA, hence the name deoxyribonucleic acid. And they also have a different basis. So instead of thymine in, in RNA, we have uracil. Okay. All right, step five. Now we have DNA ligase is going to come in, and it's going to then connect or ligate or glue together, you can think of it that way, um, the DNA fragments, the Okazaki fragments, on the lagging strand um, using what's called the phosphodiester bond. Um, so we now have a continuous strand of DNA. It's taking those little fragments that we fooled DNA polymerase strain into making and putting them together into one continuous strand. Now, in HL, you do need to know all the enzymes I have listed in this lesson. Um, in reality, if you guys are taking biology at university, there, will, there are more enzymes. There's more steps in this process where you're just doing kind of the intro year one 
um, university level kind of of this process. But it's definitely a lot to memorize, a lot to study, so spend some time on it. Don't try and do it all in one day. Spend some time and really um, try to find the logic and the patterns to help you remember what's happening here. Okay, here's your key ideas. And check for understanding, write them down. If you have any questions, please ask. Okay, let's talk about other parts of the DNA. So not all the DNA codes for proteins. Some are sequences that are non-coding regions that have different kinds of purposes. Some are removal for translation. Um, that's one purpose, we call them introns. So introns, we'll talk about RNA processing later, but introns are the non-coding parts that are gonna be removed in the DNA. Um, only the exons leave the nucleus. Um, others have different kinds of functions. Some of those functions would include telomeres, which you can see here in the second diagram. They're showing they protect the very ends of your chromosome. We also have um, gene, regu gene regulatory sequences. They're important for gene expression, like promoters, inhibitors, enhancers. They help regulate the genes and know, help the body turn on which genes are being transcribed and then translated and which ones are not at which time. And we also have non-coding RNA genes, like the genes we need to make a tRNA, which we need for translation, or genes to make um, ribosomes. All those different kinds of things are part of the DNA that are necessary to express those genes, but are not actually coding for proteins themselves. Okay, now satellite DNA um, is like DNA that's not non-coding DNA, that's kind of at the periphery of the sequence, um, often it is what are called STRs, or short tandem repeats. Short repeats of specific genetic sequences. These are often found in centromeres of chromosome. Remember, centromeres are the center part of the chromosome that are attached onto for um, mitosis and meiosis. It also can be structural component of what's called heterochromatin, or the chromatin level of DNA folding. And they're really, really useful for DNA profiling. We're trying to compare the DNA of more than one individual. Um, we often use STRs to help us do that because no two are, are likely to have the same number of STRs. And it's a lot more efficient and cost effective to analyze STRs than to analyze the entire sequence of the DNA. Okay, so they're common and repetitive. We can use a certain restriction enzyme to cut them. Remember, restriction enzymes are enzymes that cut the DNA or RNA at a specific sequence. Um, and then compare the number of repeats using gel electrophoresis. So here we go. Here's how this would work. Um, we have here DNA being run through a gel. So these little bands represent samples of DNA. And the further they run through the gel, you're going to start off the negative side and move towards the positive. Um, the further they go, the smaller they are. And if they line up exactly, it's going to be the exact same sequence. So these two are the same, but these are not the same. How this works is you put make your agarose gel, and we will do a lab with this hopefully, um, is they're going to make the gel and you load the sample into the wells, little kind of indents in the gel. Then you place the entire gel into um, a dish that contains a electrolyte solution that conducts electricity and it connects a power supply to the negative and positive parts of the circuit. So the DNA goes from the negative towards the positive. It's because DNA itself has a slight negative charge because the phosphate's on it and it will move naturally towards the positive side. Okay. Um, so if bands from of SDRs, if they match um, those of the individual testing, we can see them a match. Um, because some of the number of STRs are the same. Um, if we can look at more than one sample of STRs, we get even more accurate matches, often used for paternity testing, for crime scene analysis, that kind of thing, looking for the individual to see what is in common and what is not. Okay, let's go through how DNA is sequenced. So DNA sequencing, and then DNA packaging, and then we'll be done with this subtopic, guys. So DNA sequencing. Profiling is very useful for just comparing two samples, but it only shows patterns and actually tell you what the bases are, what the sequences, what the genes actually are in that individual. Um, so, 
sometimes we want to sequence the entire genome. Why do we want to do this? What's the usefulness of this? Well, we can sequence the entire genome. We can look for evolutionary connections by similar genes. We can figure out exactly what is being coded for where, and that can then affect the, um, the proteins being produced and maybe look for patterns of disease inheritance, look for patterns of traits, what DNA codes for what trait, that kind of thing. The Sanger method is one of the earliest methods designed to sequence DNA, and it relies on the idea of these dideoxynucleotides, or DDNTPs, um, and how it works is DDNTPs are bases, like A, T, C, and G, um, and they allow for culminary base pairing. There's one important structural difference that differentiates them, and that's a lack of a hydroxyl group, a three prime OH group, um, which means they can't form a proper phosphodiester bond with the next base, which means it kind of stops the entire DNA sequence from continuing. So if you have a DDNTP, it will correctly bond with its complementary base, but no base after that can bond because it can't make a chain. They can't form the right kind of bond to continue slacking that one little OH group. Okay, so we see here, here are DDNTPs, and here we have just a hydrogen group, and they, on the regular NTPs we have a lack, we don't have an oxygen, but that lack of oxygen here means it can't bond the next one and keep going. So no phosphodiester bond forming because we're lacking that OH here. So how does this work? Well, oftentimes we very likely tag the DDNTPs so we can see them much easier um, by after running through a gel, and we can use the gel, put it in a stain that will show that um, radioactivity much more clearly. So first, we take the DNA section, we cut it with a restriction enzyme, and then copy it using PCR a ton of times, many, many copies. And then we let the copies replicate, um, not in the, not but it's a way, with both regular bases to make regular strands, but also with the presence of DDNTPs. And the idea is that what will happen is they'll start copying up between the DNA, but it will stop if it incorporates the DDNTP into the regular base, it will just stop after that. So you have these little incomplete fragments. So what happens here, let's look at this diagram, here's the DNA sequence, and allowing it to replicate, what happens is these yellow looking ones, those are DDNTPs. And it will start to replicate and when, it, when a DNA um, polymerase pulls in a DDNTP instead of a regular base, that just stops it. So we end up having these shorter and longer versions here. So to figure this out, what we do is then run the, these, all these fragments through gelatophoresis. And the furthest bands are the earliest bands because they have uh, the smallest bands. And what you do is you just do each little vial contains all of it with only one particular letter of DDNTP. So only G DDNTPs here, only C, only A, only T. You take those four samples and you run each of them separately in different part of the well. And then you see where they stop. So the first letter here is going to be A, A, T. C, A, A, C, G, T. That's the sequence of this gene because that's the, you have one stop for every sequence and you can tell by which column it stopped in which base it was because this was all the A's, all the T's, all the C's and G's. And what stopped it was the last letter being ADD and DP. Okay, so lots of steps this process here again to figure all this out. Okay, here's another diagram to show how it works. Is we have our DNA seeds we're looking at, figuring out, and then we're adding an A DDNTP, a C1, a G1, and a T1, and then that's going to replicate and add the DNTP where that letter happens to be. And we separate them using gel, one gel column, one well for each letter. And the other sequence is here, is G, A, T, T, C, G, A, G, C, T, A, G, A. This is not a simple process, it takes a long time. We've moved on to more computer-based efficient methods of doing this nowadays, um, but this is the original process. And the IP wants you to know it. Okay, here are your key ideas for this part. Pause the video, write them down, check for understanding, please. OK, 
Okay, let's finish by talking about how DNA is packaged. So, DNA is crazy small, but really, really long, which is kind of hard to understand. So here's a nice example for you. If you were to take out the DNA of a single human cell and stretch it out, it would be about two meters long from one of your cells, and you have billions of cells in your body. Okay, two meters long. Um, it would be incredibly thin because we can't actually see the naked eye. Um, if you took what, all the DNA of an average adult human, it would be twice as long as the diameter of our entire solar system. That's how much DNA we have in our bodies. So if that's how much DNA we have, how the heck can we fit all that DNA and all those cells inside of our body? Well, it is very carefully packaged. We're talking about DNA strand here, it's the, the long length we're talking about, but it's going to get packaged again and again and again and again and again. All these steps to keep it packaged and organized and fit into our cells, but also be readily accessible for replication, for transcription, all of those kinds of things. So how does this work? Well, in this terms of the cell cycle, we're talking about mitosis and interphase, um, the DNA has to be tightly packaged, other times it has to be easily accessed. So when and why... This is going to be different, the packaging. Well, it depends how much access to the DNA we need. If we're replicating the entire DNA sequence like we're going to do in the replication phase or S phase of interphase of a cell cycle, then we'd have access to DNA. If we're transcribing, we're only taking one part of the DNA, one gene we need to have access to. So at transcription, um, the DNA is at what's called the nucleosome level, which we can see here in this picture. The red is the DNA. So it can still be accessed, but it's still quite packaged, more compact. In interphase and um, cell replication interphase of the is happening in the chromatin level, where it's kind of looser packaged, still, still organized, but not crazy tightly packaged. Metaphase and anaphase goes back into chromosomes because we need to be able to move the DNA around correctly and accurately and not miss any DNA for any particular cell. So we have it in chromosomes. And then those are three main different times, different situations here. Chromosome, chromatin, or nucleosome. Now the IB has required that you guys understand what nucleosomes are and their structure. So nucleosomes are how we package one with the for how we package DNA. Um, so nucleosome itself is made of eight histones. So here are these eight orangey yellow balls. Those are eight histones proteins that make around a single nucleosome. So the purple thing here is a nucleosome, the gray is the DNA. From a top view, it's a side view of it as a diagram. So DNA is wrapped around that to help keep it organized and safe and all those things. When DNA is carefully packaged around it, it can then be coiled multiple times again and again. We then call that super coiling, when the coiling has happened many, many times. Okay. So take a look at those Microsoft images. Can you identify the structures you see there? Here's a little hint for you. It's from our BioModel 3, which is a great website to use. These are our histones. These little coils on the chromatin, binding it around. Okay, if you go to the BioModel 3 website, which you looked at several times before, and look at the link between DNA and histone proteins, um, here's a screenshot of that, and I was just you spent some time manipulating them in three dimensions and looking at them and trying to complete your notes with some good screenshots to help you really visualize the connection between histones and DNA. Okay, here's our last key ideas for the day. And that is the end of that lesson. Um, next class, we're going to do 2.7, the second half, doing translation for SL students. And then don't worry, Charles, we'll do translation for you after. All right, hope this is helpful for you guys. Have a good day.